we look at building the best version of India, it becomes important to look back on how we got to the present. Reimagining India involves rethinking traditional approaches to governance, economy, society and culture and embracing innovative ideas and solutions. Now as we converse about reimagining the very idea of India, we are joined by two very diverse perspectives today. Our first speaker, Dr. Parakala Prabhakar, is a renowned political economist and the managing director of Right Folio. Now with his expertise in economic policy and governance, Dr. Prabhakar has been a leading voice in shaping India's economic landscape. Joining him today is Dr. Vikram Sampath, a prolific historian and author known for his insightful narratives on Indian history. Dr. Sampath's works have not only enlightened readers, but also inspired a deeper understanding of India's cultural heritage. Please join me in welcoming on stage Dr. Parkala Prabhakar and Dr. Vikram Sampath. Please join us on stage, gentlemen. A very warm welcome to you both. And may I also invite senior journalist Shankar Ayer to kindly chair this session. Alright, it's over to Shankar Ayer now. Suprabhatam, good morning, Vandanam, Vanakkam, Namaskar. How do we describe India? So when we speak about India, it's in many flavors, many colors, many cultures. And so the question really is, our title is Reimagining India, Two Perspectives. Uh, let's start with the big question as to why do we need to reimagine India? Are we reimagining India or are we reimagining Bharat? Are we reimagining Bharat as the Bharat that was? Are we reimagining the India that we saw last night at Javed Saab's musical performance or are we reimagining the India that applauded when India sort of took the wickets of the English cricket team? So, let's start by like five minutes, uh, Pr uh, Prabhakar, if you can sort of st start off saying, why do you think we need to reimagine India? Thank you very much, uh, Shankar. I'm really honored to be here with uh, Sampat and thank you very much for the organizers to uh, have given me a chance to be here. Shankar, I'll, uh, I'll first of all tell you what I'm not going to discuss and then I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to discuss and how I would like to go about. I'm not going to make this into a kind of a, a dog fight between me and Vikram. No, no, with, I mean ideally That's we, one. we need a vision from you. That's one. Yeah. And second thing is of course, you know, uh, it's also not about uh, what the nation wants to know now, right now, tonight. That we can wait for, you know, till the prime time debates. Um, I think, as you said, this is a very serious question that we need to um, meditate on. Think about it quite seriously. Shankar, I I traveled from Hyderabad last night at the security check the constable was repeatedly saying one tray one bag that one could put one bag 
in one tree. That's all. For a second, I was astonished why this constable was making a political statement. One tree, one bag, one nation, one election, one nation, one language, one nation, one leader, one nation, one, one nation, one. It's, then I realized it's a very, you know, um, a transactional thing in an airport. But that is the kind of so-called reimagining India that is happening today. Now, what I discovered, Shankar, is that this kind of a reimagining that we see today, this kind of a reimagined discourse that we see today, is nothing actually a reimagined discourse or reimagined idea of India, but a repurposed idea of India, a repurposed discourse of India, harking back to early 19th century, especially after the British power has consolidated from 1818 onwards after the comprehensive defeat of the Marathas. From then onwards, if you see, how did, there were a lot of strands. How do we look at India? What is India? Who are Indians? And what kind of a nation are we going to build? And how do we fight the British? How do we fight the colonialism? How do we fight the imperialism? And after we secure independence, how do we build the nation? There were lots of strands. And in the fight, there were several streams, violent, non-violent, pacifist, applicants, supplicants, agitations, etc., etc. But you see, what when, when we look at all those people who fought in their own different ways, in their own different methods, in their own journeys, their own paths, what is the most important thing for us to look at is what, what, what could have been the consequences of the different strands, consequences or implications for the polity, for the economy, for the individual, for castes, for religions, for groups, for languages, for regions, etc., etc. Now, if this is the background, then I would say what we see today, the, the so-called reimagining or the so-called recasting of India and the Indian uh, imagination is a repurposed narrative from those times that India belongs to certain people, India belongs to people who worship in a certain way, India belongs to people who follow a certain religion, India belongs to uh, people who speak a certain language, India belongs to people who reside in, in a particular geographical area, etc., etc., as opposed to a narrative or an imagination which is an enlightened imagination, which is in line with the, the, the forward movement of history. India belongs to everybody who is here, every citizen, and citizenship is not related to your language or religion or region or anything, but whoever is in India is an Indian, and the liberal, diverse, not just tolerance, but acceptance of differences, of, of looking at every person, every language, every region as equal owners or equal participants in this long journey of India. This is another. So this reimagining, which is in tune with the modern times and which doesn't say, look, this last 70 years or 60 years or 50 years have been an aberration. Not an aberration, but a progress. Leaving aside or leaving those practices and those belief systems that were actually unscientific, primitive, um, misogynistic, etc., etc. And I, I, of course, Vikram, Vikram knows much better. Now, you see, if, if, you, if you look at it, people who had uh, advocated 
that this country individually is not the one, but the groups. It could be Varnashtama, it could be Jati, it could be caste, it could be anything, or religion. Are we looking at that kind of an imagination of India? Or are we looking at a citizen and citizen-centric republic, democracy, plurality, liberalism? Are we looking at this? These are the two strands which I think the later one which I said should be the way to reimagine India and go forward. Quite accidentally, Vikram, I am sitting on the left. But that doesn't mean that I am representing the left view. And he's, you are to my right, to, to your right. Uh, there is a conception, there is a construct, uh, a kind of hummed narrative, not a spoken narrative, that there is an element of othering that is prevalent, that there are issues. The other aspect, I mean the flip side of it is that people have been othered for 70 years and they are finding a voice to sort of express themselves. In this, my concern is that are we losing track of the idea of diversity, uni unity in diversity, what we used to call vivitta me ekta. Uh, and all our Sanskrit shlokas are full of uh, inclusion. I mean, you know, I, I, I struggle to find a shloka which is exclusive. So, is there a reason why people have this conception about uh, the hegemony of homogeneity in the sense of one language. But, I mean, you know, um, we can get into the structural aspects of how uh, we need to reimagine India. I'm particularly worried about the North-South question that has popped up. I'm worried when uh, I speak many languages, but I'm, uh, I, mean, I, I will be uh, forced to oppose if a particular language is uh, imposed on men. Uh, incidentally, all three of us are from South India, so there is some commonality there. But where do you think the debate is located? And in your own writings, I mean, you've written about Gaur Jha at one level and written about Vik, Vik, uh, Vik Savarkar on the other side, I mean, you know, not on the other side literally, but it's, it's a cultural spectrum. Do you think there is an othering of India? Is that charge valid? Thank you, Shankar. It's a great pleasure to share stage with Dr. Prabhakar, whom I greatly admire for his scholarship, uh, and to be with all of you this morning. Uh, as a historian, and I'm very glad Dr. Prabhakar prefaced his opening statements with the fact that we don't want a dogfight. I don't think anyone wants that uh, as much as the television TRPs would demand such, uh, you know, uh, fights. But as a historian, I would like to say that when one looks back at the past, and today all these debates and discussions are contestations of history, where history has become a live battlefield. A very famous American historian had once said, what people did in the past is not stored in amber. You know, every generation looks back and drawing from its own experiences makes patterns of the past and the present. So when we are saying we are reimagining Indian past, uh, I don't see it as something that is necessarily bad or something that is necessarily a political project that someone sitting somewhere is sponsoring for a group of hideous people, uh, you know, trying to say, okay, let's change this narrative so that we can get electoral dividends. Uh, that may have some uh, element of truth somewhere, but by and large, to rubbish away the entire, you know, change that is palpable in Indian society today, uh, to, to just a political project or a, uh, something that is linked to an ideology or a political party, I think that would be slightly, you know, missing the point. We just saw what happened during the Pratishthan of the Ram uh, Temple in Ayodhya. Uh, of course, the movement was led by the Sangh Parivar in the 90s, which brought uh, the temple movement into public consciousness. But during the consecration ceremony, uh, the Pran Pratishtha, uh, common Indians across the length and breadth of India who had nothing to do with the BJP, RSS, VHP or anything who were also feeling that this was a day of renaissance and resurgence where after 500 years of struggle we've got back one of our most sacred spots. To say that that is just, uh, you know, a very, very bigoted project of some political party 
uh, I think you're, you're being totally uh, not in sync with the uh, with the mood of the people. We need to wake up and smell the coffee, the filter coffee, which is coming straight from uh, the ground. Uh, now, just in the session before ours, um, Dr. Tharoor and Ms. Braverman spoke about history uh, and about uh, and Dr. Tharoor there. Uh, very rightly also questioned her about the atrocities of uh, the British Empire. But uh, many, very often uh, he and his party don't want us to question the atrocities of the invaders prior to the British Empire, uh, the, the Mughal Empire. Uh, they became us is the uh, normal narrative which is not so much the case. Uh, they were as much oppressors as the British Empire was uh, in a different manner. It was cultural Im uh, imperialism of another kind. Uh, now to, to even question these or to talk about some of these aspects uh, of our past uh, somehow gets you painted as, uh, as a communal and a bigoted person, which is, I think, the problem. Uh, Dr. Prabhakar mentioned about uh, equal rights to everybody and so on, which the Constitution, uh, you know, enshrined. Uh, very well, no one has a dispute about that. But then five years before the Indian Constitution came into force, what was called probably the right wing uh, you know party of those times the hindu mahasabha which was presided by people like vinayak damodar savarkar and shama prasad mukherjee and others came out with a draft constitution of, of free hindustan and in that there is not even one mention of uh, citizenship based on religion and in this document um, you know which i quote extensively in my book too uh, they say every citizen of india is is equal in the eyes of the law irrespective of the religion uh, religion has nothing to do with the uh, you know the um, the majority community the hindus will not get any extra privileges because they are uh, in a majority and conversely the minorities will not get extra concessions only because they are a minority in the eyes of the law everybody is equal uh, and this was the stated position of the ultra right party of that time and a lot of these thoughts actually flowed into the final indian constitution too and in the constitution assembly debates, uh, several members of the Congress actually acknowledged that the Hindu Mahasabha's views on this were quite egalitarian and they would be adopting some of these uh, views into it, uh, into the final draft of the constitution. So this fact that, you know, uh, there is one set of people who actually discriminate on the basis of something, I don't know if that is historical enough to actually, uh, uh, on a political side, uh, on a political side of the most ultra-right party is actually, uh, uh, you know, giving equal rights to everybody without appeasement of any section. Uh, what else is secularism? Uh, he also spoke about the caste differences and so on. Now, Hindutva by its very definition would actually be anti-caste. Uh, if, if Hindutva is a movement or a f political ideology and philosophy to unite Hindus, it would never want them to be divided on the basis of caste. So right from Savarkar to Golwalkar to the Vishwa Hindu Parishad and others, uh, all through their long history had always advocated for a casteless Hindu society because you make them on block as one unit, uh, that is what helps you. If you splinter them into caste, that is not going to help. And on the contrary, actually historically speaking, it was someone like Gandhi who in his collected writings say, I very much believe in the Varana system. I very much believe uh, in which he had a constant running debate with Ambedkar too, uh, where he said, I believe that the Varna system is not odious and for Hinduism to remain, the Varna system is essential. Uh, so who is the right wing here and who is the, uh, you know, non-right here? So I think we've got a lot of facts all muddled up uh, for, you know, you know uh, contemporary political rhetoric, which is fine in some way and for, as, uh, you know, Dr. Prabhakar mentioned, the, the, the TRPs and dog fights. But if you actually get into the historical facts, uh, I think the, the, the fact is somewhere totally uh, different from what we talk about. So, uh, in some senses, you know, the Hindu way or the Indian way, we all believe in that there are many versions of the truth. And so the debate goes on whether there are many versions of the truth. Shall I, shall I just add to that? I mean, I, I do understand. I mean, this is always, uh, you know, thrown back saying, Ekam Sat Vipra Bhauda Vadanti and all of that. It's a wonderful virtue to have. But, you know, is everybody signing, it, signing up to this uh, rule of the club? If you have an opponent who says my way or the highway, this is the only path to God and anybody who does not uh, subscribe to this, we have the divine sanction to 
persecute you, to kill you, to convert you, to break your, uh, I, uh, you know, places of worship. And that's a sanction. It's not an 18th Fair century. Enough. It's not a 12th century. It's happening as we speak. No, no. It's happening uh, in our neighborhoods. Uh, it's happening in the parts of, uh, uh, you know, pre-partitioned India where the percentage of minorities has gone down. So theologically, when we are faced with that, what does the faith which has all these egalitarian principles do? Does it still just keep quoting the scriptures? Or does it also have some amount of uh, organization only for self-defense? Not necessarily for proactive attack on anybody, but you are not even allowed to organize yourself to uh, against any predatory attempts. I think that is, uh, we are the only pagan civilization which is still surviving. And there is so something I'll, to that. I will make a couple of points in the sense that I don't think I am qualified to defend Mahatma Gandhi. So I will leave him to defend himself in his works about what he said in Varna. Certainly there are many things uh, that one can debate about. But Vikram, the, the point that I was making is this, that in the Indian system, you have to worry about what is implicit and what is explicit. The explicit actually, uh, if we go back to the uh, founding of the constitution, I mean the word secular and was not used because the idea was that which is implicit should not be stated explicitly. Subsequently in the 70s it was stated for whatever reason. So in the, in the same train of thought there is a feeling that while everything and I am just presenting the case as it is being put out by the other side of the narrative is that while we say that there are no rights have been taken away, there, are, there is an equality, that uh, issues are uh, enshrined in the constitution, the fundamental rights. The point that we often sort of get confronted with when legislation is made, whether the legislation in terms of citizenship, you know, the, the kind of uh, fog that envelops uh, some of the legislation. Be that as it may, I am I'm rather skeptical, skeptical of any political party saying that we are not in in uh, in a caste uh, race and uh, that we don't uh, f factor caste in our equations because all electoral maths has an em element of demography. But we'll park that here and I, I think we, we should have a longer conversation on what is explicit and implicit. But uh, Prabhakar, this point that uh, Vikram made, which is right, so I mean, you know, for, for decades, a particular version of history, and you know, history is written by victors and so if if for 60 years a certain uh, political establishment was a victor the next establishment which comes in feels it is entitled to write the history i mean is this not uh, part of their entitlement is are you saying that there should be uh, a, a kind of cut off on uh, representing history or representing facts um, Vikram spoke about the Ram Mandir uh, Pratishthan thing and a lot of people feel that uh, and a lot of people Vikram also feel that why will it stop at that or are we going east and west again uh, on some other uh, projects. So where, how do you see this uh, Prabhakar? Shankar, I am not going to, you know... Uh, no, no, it's uh, not a response to... Yeah, yeah, it's uh, not that. But uh, you uh, see, uh, I, yeah. I just want to make two quick points before I, I come to what you have uh, referred to. Um, you know, uh, uh, Vikram mentioned about Hindu Mahasabha, in, but uh, Vikram, Hindu Mahasabha has also referred the Hindu-Muslim question to the League of Nations, decided to refer the Hindu-Muslim question to the League of Nations in 1940. Don't forget that. But you see, that, that's, I mean, there are so many nuances. But the point is this. How do we look at a person residing in India? Do we look at that person as belonging to a particular varna or a jati or a caste or a religion or a citizen or a speaker of a particular language? This is, or do you look at, without any of these qualifications, do you look at that person as a person or a citizen? That's one. Now look at, I mean, uh, he has also mentioned about Ekam Sat, Bahuda, Vipra, Bahuda, Vadanti, etc. You know, there are, there are many of these kind of uh, things in our, uh, you know, Sanskrit literature. But the point is this, point is this, that the Varnashram, Dharma, 
which directly comes to us from a Purusha Sukta, which says, Brahmano Asya Mukhamasit Bahu Bahu Rajanya Kritaha Uru Yadasya Tad Vaisya Sudra Padabhya. Somebody who comes from the Pada, somebody who comes from the thigh, somebody who comes from the uh, shoulder, somebody who comes from the mouth. The, this, and the, the, these four are really categories. And, you know, all the strands that he was talking about, they went on saying for a long time, even today, they do not disown these or they do not deserve of this, they still feel that the Indian democracy, it is, it, is, it is recorded, Indian democracy should be based not on individuals but on groups. That stand was also debated in the Constituent Assembly. And what we have as a document today is after a lot of churning. Now, when you had, you know, especially uh, uh, since Vikram wrote about Savarkar, Let's, let's, let's see, you know, just before Savaka when he also talks about, you know, what, what was the uh, socio-cultural milieu at, around that time. Dogs and pigs were allowed to go into the city of Pune between 9 in the morning and 3 in the afternoon, but not untouchables because at that time the shadow of a person is very long and even Falling of a shadow of an untouchable on a savarna is very polluting. You know, that was the kind of milieu. And do we go back to that kind of a differentiation? It may, it may not look today. But you know, slowly and slowly, this is the value system that is being re-enthroned. This is the value system that is being, you know, glorified. And, and you know, and th there is this sl slow narrative of, no, uh, let me finish it, uh, Vikram. I'm not saying that you are doing it, but uh, there is an atmosphere. Nobody is, nobody is, that's uh, a nobody. You, 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 you can't say that, you can't say that. But you see, these kind of a value systems, they have to be seen and people who are trying to propagate this kind of a value system, they will have to come clean and say, look, this Purusha Sukta has nothing to do with us. This kind of a practices which were untouchability, you know, and there are, there are very eminent people who wrote that women's minds are biologically inferior. I, I can quote that. You know, and, and, and there are very revered figures. I do not want to name them now, but, you know, they are very revered figures. They, they said they are on record. And the, all these things have happened. People were not allowed to get into the schools. So this, there is, this is the underpinning. This no, is the value system which is yeah, underpinning. So I uh, got your point, Prabhakar. What, what you are sort of placing is that there are people who come from a particular context. That's and, right. And, no, and, no. and you know, that Shankar, Shankar that, that is the kind of reimagining India. This is actually a repurposed reimagining which was already done and dusted okay. in the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. As I said, Hindu-Muslim question was, was decided to be referred to the League of Nations in 1940 by Hindu Mahasabha. So How do we look at that? Okay, Prabhakar. So, no, come, I, the, uh, Shankar, I mean, I'll just... Yeah, uh, yeah. So, the, the case that the way I see it is that there were many reformists within the Mahasabha, within uh, uh, the uh, RSS. Uh, certainly the people that I knew were uh, anti-caste, but there are people. So again, it comes back to the implicit and explicit thing. And, you know, I want to bring it back to contemporary. Uh, do, you, do you think that there is a case where these earlier historic contexts are coming back, are they being imposed and is this part of the othering story and you know you might want to respond to what Prabhakar said. See first of all I don't know who is uh, getting back to these uh, old straight jackets, I really have no idea. This is a rhetorical uh, non-fact based uh, assertion uh, and if we need to, I mean the Purusha Sukta may have said something but then no one, no one says 
that the leg is a bad part of the body. Just cut off your leg and try to see whether you can walk for a few days. So it may have stratified you to different parts of a human anatomy, but where is it implicit there that the leg is something inferior to the head? Without the leg, you can't do a single day's work. Now, if you need to condemn that, will we also condemn those verses of a particular holy book? which divides the world into believers and non-believers? No, we don't. We don't. Just quoting a uh, reference. Sir, sir, please. No. Yeah, who's preventing? We saw what happened to Nupur Sharma. Uh, she just quoted verses of the holy book and we had the whole country go in flames. Uh, we had Sartan Se Juda happening all over the uh, you know, streets. Condemnation is not enough, but then you, uh, day in and day out, we can go on and also castigate uh, Hindu scriptures, but nobody uh, uh, reacts in such a violent uh, manner. Just yesterday you had the Dioband coming out with uh, a, a plan, and Dioband is not some small little organization, uh, saying by 2047 we want the uh, Gazwai Hind in India. Now these are real threats. These are real, uh, if you can close your eyes and say these don't exist and we are living in our make-believe of everyone is the same, but then there are differences which we need to acknowledge. Uh, and you know, uh, your uh, earlier idea that the victors will write history, certainly, I mean history has always been the handmaiden of the victors, but the, the supporters of this government actually castigated for not writing history enough. Uh, you know, we have had HRD ministers of this government who say in the last 10 years we have not uh, changed one single line of, uh, you know, the history textbook, I, I as if it's a matter of... Uh, I don't great. know, but several parts of history have been taken off the books, Vikram. No, no, I mean, that is, uh, that's, that's a yeah, rationalization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have to study only about Delhi, we mm -hmm. need to study about other parts of India. So maybe uh, what is taken out, what is added, that's another issue. Uh, but then, you know, uh, the, the, the whole history project too is something that is happening outside the precincts of the government and the uh, ideological cohorts, which is what I told you right at the start. So to dub everybody who's trying to find that voice again, uh, everybody who's trying to, I mean, uh, the India was not born in 1950 with the promulgation of the constitution, which is what the constitutional patriots would want us to believe. I think the, the civilizational ethos of this nation, which far predates the constitution, and the constitution on the converse draws from this uh, ethos. Why else would the part three and the, the fundamental rights have Rama, Tita, Lakshmana on uh, the, the, the fundamental rights? Today, if someone sees that, they'll call that a Sanghi propaganda. Uh, the very fact that they were exemplars of virtuosity and someone who are civilizational beacons is something that the founding fathers and mothers of this nation and the constituent assembly actually realized. Fair but enough, to even yeah. do that today would no, be no, claimed it, it, as a right-wing bigoted uh, propaganda, no, no, which you, is unfortunate. That's a, that's, that's a very fair point uh, in the sense that what was seen at that time is seen differently now. I mean, this is, the, this is what I said, that there are con contextual conceptions and uh, points. If, yeah, I just, I mean, if you just allow me like two sentences. Yeah. Now, for all the uh, so-called, you know, assertion of Hinduism and so on, uh, this is a country where I think Hindus are the only community who don't get to own their temples. It's a government. Where is this a secular nation when the government controls all our temples, whereas no other community in this country, they can run their own institutions, they can run their uh, educational institutions. I come from Karnataka, where just now, there are three, in the budget, you have 300 crores for the Vakf, uh, you have 200 crores for Christian institutions, and 10% tax for the Hindu uh, temples, about one crore. Uh, and this is, and 75% of Delhi, uh, is actually Vakf property. So after defense and railways, the largest landowner in India is the Vakf, well, including Mukesh Ambani's house is on Vakf property. The Delhi High Court is Vakf. Uh, the Central Vista is Vakf. And the Vakf Act of 1995 can uh, evict anybody. You don't have even, you can't go to a civil court. You have a Vakf tribunal which will uh, try you. You have a Places of Worship Act which will ensure that you can't get any reclamation, legal, peaceful reclamation. Uh, there's two I, sentences. I, yeah. Uh, I, that thing is flashing there, so I've I got to sort of wrap but up. But just, just let you allow me uh, hmm. maybe uh, 15 sentences. Hmm. Uh, you see, why, why does the state intervene? Why does the state intervene to say that untouchability is unlawful? It state intervenes. You, know, you can say, well, it's, it's for us to decide. And Vikram talked about the temples. Shankar, I tell you, you know, in temples, 
varnashram dharma the 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 atrocious side of varnashram dharma was in the temples you see you had one caste one one which came out with the mouth could enter the garbhagraha and the other one could stand 3 feet away the other one could stand 7 feet away the other one could stand 10 feet away and from the 10 feet onwards the jatis the castes one can stand 12 feet away another could stand only 15 feet away 17 feet away 19 feet away 21 feet away and some others could not even come into the temple not only come into the temple but also so could, we'll not control temples. could not walk on so we'll control could, temples. Could, could not walk on the streets leading to the temple now this is the reason why the state had intervened yeah. and the state no, is Prabhakar, the British state. Not. Wait a minute. Wait yeah. no, no, so can the state wait. also intervene to ensure there is no halala, there is no triple talaq, there is a uniform civil court. It is okay. not being, isn't there it? Is no, not. That is called as a bigoted no, criminal agenda. Why should not? Should why is be. there so gender yes, empowerment, uh, Muslim women uh, no, can I, be married I, I, off I at 13? I, I wouldn't like to cross talk. <laughs> finish it, you finish it. But then why do you cross talk? See, the point is this point is are we looking at individuals as individuals with equal rights or are we looking at them as belonging to castes regions religions etc etc this is how we, we have to look at the way to reimagine now the reimagining that is now going on is only a repurposing of the reimagining or imagining that has happened in the 1880s and 1890s and 1910s and 1940s so as you all can see the reimagining of India is an ongoing work in progress project and this is a project I mean in the 40s they used to call the Congress the Hindu party uh, I think now the, the flip side is uh, playing out so this is a conversation that we need to have it is important to have as to how we reimagine India in my own construct I would like to reimagine India where the air is free of pollution to breathe them the children in schools have teachers where the hospitals have doctors where people have jobs but that is a part of the narrative that sort of as both of them agree it doesn't often appear on television screens but needs to appear more i shall wrap up this i think this is a conversation everybody needs to have thank you very much thank you both Absolutely. of you for a for a scholarly discussion and it's been a feisty debate and we do hope it carries on off stage and i think one other thing that we all can agree on is that in whichever way we reimagine india a constructive and healthy debate will always be part of it which is exactly what this conversation was so thank you very much for that gentlemen and please do stay on stage as i invite saurav yagnik ceo coo abp network and rajiv dubey media head dabur india to please join us on stage and present our esteemed guests with a token of our appreciation <laughs>